We've been talking for the last month about stewardship, and we've been trying to talk about this in terms of ways that are different than just talking about money, because money is certainly something we're called to steward, but there's so much more about stewardship than just money. We believe fundamentally that all that we have is a gift of God, that God is raining down gifts in our lives, and that we're called to manage this well in order to bring glory back to God. And so the first week we talked about recovering what was lost, not just pretending like our past is a thing that's long gone, but the things that that God gave us in the past that we missed, we can go back and recover. The next week we talked about understanding all that we have is a gift of God. We talked about our cell phones and our checkbook and our calendars and our keys and how these are all possibilities for us to partner with God for his mission for the world. The next week we talked about finances and tithing, and we talked about how it is possible for us in relationship to, with God to partner with God, that, it, that relationship involves both people having a stake in it, and that tithing is a way that we can show God and partner with God, that we're all in with God. And so today, in our last part of this series, I want to talk about relationships. How is it that we can steward our relationships? And and I think before we talk about stewarding relationships, I think it matters and it's important for us to say and just confess up front that for the most part in our society, as we look around and see each other, as we're honest about what's happening in our own gut and our own lives, is that for the most part, we're a people who are worn out. Yeah. Right? There's a lot of tiredness. There's a lot of uh, feeling like just one more thing may be the thing that topples it all and has it all crumble to the bottom. Uh, The most common thing that happens when I ask people, how are you doing? They'll say, I'm busy. It's a default setting. We We are operating at max capacity in so many cases, which causes us to think if there's one more thing that we have to do or manage or control, we may just go crazy. And so today when we talk about relationships, there may be things here that feel heavy and too much, but I want to say to you this, that maybe that heaviness or that difficulty isn't your problem. It it may not be that you're not functioning correctly. The problem may be something very different. For example, if you're driving down the road, minding your own business, and all of a sudden your car engine started malfunctioning and steam started coming out of your car, you wouldn't say, oh, I'm such a failure. Right? You would say, there's something wrong with the car. And you would pull over and you would open the hood and you would look at the car and try to find out what's wrong with the car. The car system is broken. Here's the thing about our worn outness, our tiredness, our our weakness, our struggle, where we're at as a society, is that we're all taking all of the blame onto ourselves. But at some point, it may be good for us to just say, the system that we're operating in is broken. There's steam coming out of the system, and it's breaking people, and we're all looking at me to say, what's wrong with me? And very few of us are taking a moment to look at the system and say, maybe this thing that we're perpetuating and operating in isn't really working. The thing about God, the thing about Jesus, the thing about the story of the scripture is that it's a peculiar story offering us to live in a peculiar system in the world. It critiques the system of the world, and God is saying, I will call you to a different way that feels like you're the peculiar one. But God's system is the one that brings about flourishing. The system that we operate, especially in the Western world, in the United States, is fundamentally broken. And in many ways, we know this, but we don't know how to get ourselves out of that system. Let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, so I'm not just talking in theory. Um, we live in a social media culture, right? Fast-paced constant messages coming at us. And so at any given moment, we can crack open our phone, go to Facebook or Instagram, and we see people with chiseled bodies, with dream vacations, beautiful cars, massive homes, well-behaved and talented children. (laughs) Right? And so we look at a model with a six-pack, and we say, oh, look how they've got it all together. And then we look at ourselves and say, I don't have a six-pack, I have a gallon. right? Then we look at other people's children and say, look at them, they're always succeeding, they're always doing well. My, my, my kids can't even pee in the toilet, 
right? Like, but here's the problem, right? We judge ourselves against our social media interactions, which is basically us playing our own insecurities, criticisms, weaknesses, and honesty against everyone else's highlight reel. And then we conglomerate everyone else's highlight reel on top of each other, assuming they have all of these things that the world is living in this one space of dream vacations and perfect children and perfect bodies. And then we look at ourselves and say, I'm a mess. I don't have it together. It's not working for me. And, and so we decide what we're going to do is we're going to work harder, parent better, read more, pick up a new hobby, start working out, finding a side hustle so we can make more money and build a better resume. And we're going to do all of this at the cost of sleep. And then we wonder why it's not all working. I'm not getting healthier. I'm not getting in better shape. I'm not getting smarter. I feel worn out. I feel exhausted. I have way too much going on. And then add unto that, the church comes in with a stewardship series and says, let's do more. It just weighs a lot. It weighs a lot. And it becomes such a struggle to match up our own internal struggles, our own internal weaknesses, the places where I'm living and struggling and doing that against a projection of perfection that's in front of us, given to us constantly on our cell phones and our TVs. And we weigh how we judge ourselves versus how perfect the images that we're given constantly. And we can only assume, we're left to only assume, that the reason I'm here and the world is there is because I'm not hustling enough. And so we just work harder and harder to keep up. And it wears us out, and we never get to the place that the perfect projections on our social media tell us. And so I ask you, in this rat race of trying to reach perfection and never quite getting there, and wearing ourselves on the way, out on the way, where is God in that? What is, what is God's call in our life look like? What is God yearning to see us sculpt and create out of our life? Most likely, it's not this hustle towards perfection that we find ourselves entrapped in. God seems to be prioritizing different things. And when God is prioritizing different things, it's probably worth us taking a step back from what we think matters and asking God in the scripture, like we will this morning, well, what truly matters? What are the things I should be chasing after? What are the times and places that I should sit back and relax and sit this one out? And when are the places where I should charge a little harder? Like I said just briefly earlier, the, the thing about God is that God invites us to be a peculiar people in the world. The world operates in a way trying to invite us to continue to work, continue to contribute, always going crazy, right? Always trying to keep up, always running the rat race, always trying to accumulate more at the cost of our own well-being, right? But God's plan is different. Even in the Old Testament, when God invites the Israelites into Sabbath, his idea is that you should work hard for six days and then take a day off to recuperate and recharge. We don't do Sabbath very well anymore, but even the ancient Israelites didn't do Sabbath real well. For some reason, we received the idea of rest as, as a, like a stone around our neck, right? And it was supposed to be a gift given to people. Don't run yourself into the ground. And even in ancient Israel, when the Israelites decided they would take this, this commandment that God had given them, this peculiar life narrative of resting upon themselves, all of the neighboring nations made fun of Israel. Bunch of lazy folk. Everyone knows you're just supposed to work hard seven days a week. How are they going to keep up? Right? That's how they talked about Israel. And so Israel knew that the system that God had given it, them about life and rest and renewal was peculiar. And that's just one way to be peculiar. This Christian way, this way of God is peculiar in the world. And I'm going to read two texts to you today, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. Both of them are seminal texts in both of the Testament, both of the eras of God's people. And, and they are peculiar ways about life, peculiar ways. The first text is going to be in Deuteronomy, and, and the story is about uh, 
uh, it's called the Shema, if you've ever heard that language before. This was a seminal text to the Israelites. Uh, they took this very literally. You'll hear it, but the idea here is that you take your faith and you pass it on to your family and you write it on your bodies and in your houses and, and faith becomes central to your life. And then the next one is Jesus talking where he quotes the Shema, but he connects our relationship to God that it flows out into our relationship with others. And, and you see that fundamental to the task of the Christian life is loving your neighbor, having right relationship. That if we have right relationship with God, it'll flow over into right relationships with our neighbors. And that if our relationship with our neighbors are out of whack, that could possibly mean that we're out of alignment with God. It's tied together. So let's read first from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and read this Shema, and then we'll read the words of Jesus. I invite you to stand with me as we honor the reading of the word of the Lord today. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. We're going to read to verse 9 here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk around the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The next text is Jesus quoting this, but saying more as well in Matthew chapter 22. We're going to read verses 34 to 40 there. Matthew 22, 34 to 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So these are fascinating texts, I think. Jesus quoting the Shema, the Shema being a, a fundamental discipleship task of the Jewish folks. Um, in fact, they received the law. There's this line in the Shema about, about um, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. The, the Jews actually had a thing called a phylactery. Now, that's quite a word, right? You should try to Google phylacter, phylactery. I, I mean, I know you're on your phones anyway. It's cool. Uh, <laughs> try to spell phylactery and Google it. It is literally a box that pious Jewish men would put on their head, and they would put the law in it. I mean, they took this very literally. They would bind ties around their arms, and they would write on their house the law. And they, they would take very seriously, sitting their children down, nothing is more important to a Jewish family than perpetuating Jewish children, right? I mean, even today, that's how it works, right? This was fundamental to their task. They believed that God had called them to be a particular kind of people in this world, and perpetuating that in their relationships, in their lives, was fundamental to who they are, to the point that they would do bizarre things in the world standards, like tie the law to their head and bind it on their arms, right? This was fundamental to who they are. So much so that when the Pharisees, the experts of the law, wanted to trap Jesus, they asked him which was the most important of the commands, thinking, you know, that maybe he would say one of the Ten Commandments. And instead, Jesus quotes the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the second, he says, he wasn't asked for the second, he carries on. The second is as important as yourself, is the first, love your neighbor as yourself. Because he believes that if you love God correctly, it will spill out into the world and you will be in right relationship with those people around you. He says all of the law and the prophets are summed up in these two commands. So you want to get your religion right. You want to be the person that God is asking you to be or calling you to be. It boils down to those simple things, right? Love God with all of you and then love your neighbor as yourself. This is the religious life that Christ is calling us to. And so we can see pretty clearly in texts like these, our relationships in our world matter. They fundamentally matter to the Christian life. If our relationships are not in good order around us, 
something is out of alignment, something is out of whack, something is not quite working right. And I feel like this is a fundamental problem to the world that we live in today. We live in unaligned relationship with one another. Our sense of community is not quite working, and therefore other things are falling out of place. Let me talk about this just a little bit. If, if you were to live in a place that struggles with precipitation, that doesn't get enough, maybe a desert, a place like Australia, maybe uh, one of the deserts in California, you have to ration your water differently than we do. If, if I wanted to go water my lawn, I'd just go to the side of the house and turn it on, no big deal. But when there's not enough water, you have to hang uh, um, buckets on the side of your house and collect rainwater and then use it appropriately for unnecessary tasks like watering your lawn or your flowers. And so on Australia, they have these basins attached to their house where they collect rainwater in order to, to water their lawn. Uh, we don't have that problem here because I've lived here for almost a year and it hasn't stopped raining since I got here. <laughs> so that's apparently not a problem in, in the Baltimore area. But anyways, um, so they collect in their different tasks that they want to do in their house, and then they distribute it in that way. And so um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the blessings that God gives us if, if, as if it's rain. Now, these three buckets in front of us are going to be a metaphor. They're all empty, so there's no water involved. No one's going to get wet today. But if these were um, the buckets of our lives and that rain was God's blessing poured upon us, in order for us to flourish or thrive in life, uh, social, social psychologists and thinkers would think that these are the three things we truly need to thrive. Notice none of them are stuff, right? These are the three things we need to thrive. The first is freedom, the second is community or relationships, and the third is meaning, all right? Freedom, community, and meaning. Those are the three things that human beings need in order to thrive. Now, here's the problem. God is pouring out blessings upon us that we could fill all three of these buckets to full. God has given us these gifts in our life so that we can have meaning, we can have community, we can have freedom, and we can therefore thrive. But we have a problem in Western culture. This is the system that's struggling. This is the problem we have. We love freedom. Okay? We love freedom. Let me, let me just point out how much we love freedom, okay? Now, freedom is good. You need freedom. If, uh, if you live in North Korea today, your freedom bucket is empty, and you, you need freedom, right? There's nothing wrong with freedom. Freedom is good. It's one of the three things, right? But in the Western culture, we are just so constantly drinking from the bucket of freedom that we are drunk on freedom, and we want more Ooh, we want our freedom. And it costs us in the two other buckets of community and meaning. Uh, just a great example of, of freedom. When I was younger, I had a friend who was in college. I was, I was now his pastor. And we're great friends today, so I'm really not knocking him. I love this guy with all my heart. But he would come over to my house. I would, I'd invite him over. He'd come over and hang out. We'll play video games, watch a movie or whatever. And he would come over and he'd sit on his phone waiting for a better option to come. And just as soon as someone texted him with a better option, he would ditch me, and he would go out and do the better option. And he was pretty clear, like, this is who I am. Like, I'm always waiting for the better option. Like, but we all have that friend, and some of us are that friend, right? That we want to keep our calendar as free as possible so that when something big comes up, we don't have to get out of obligations. We're waiting for the next big thing to happen. Some of us are even willing to keep a busy calendar and then hurt people's feelings when better options come up. We want freedom. Maybe you're the kind of parent who's been uh, binging that brand new HBO show, and now your kid is calling to you from upstairs, and you just want them to go to sleep so you can watch your show. And you're leaving you know, your parent parental responsibility behind because you want freedom to do what you want to do, right? Your marriage may be struggling because you're trying to assert your personal freedom in your marriage rather than submitting to one another. We love freedom, we love autonomy, and we will drink big gulps from freedom at the expense of the other two things that we need. Uh, for example, um, young folks today are talking about community, needing relationships and community to no end. 
Um, it just their lack of relationship, community, places to plug in is at an all-time high. It's an epidemic. But at the same time, at the same time, churches are also reporting doing dinners for young folks and having no one show up, right? Uh, we could talk about this over and over and over about how, how in order to have community, in order to have relationships, we need to be willing to risk some of our freedom to put into there. We've got to submit to one another in friendship. It's possible, for example, that if you have 12 friends who all want to get together, the other 11 may choose a restaurant that you don't like. So your choice is, do you assert your freedom to not go to the restaurant you don't like, or do you choose community and relationship, right? So often, we are guilty of choosing freedom for ourselves to make me number one at an astounding rate at the cost of community. The final one is meaning or purpose. What, what is it that we're driving for, striving for? What is it that's making the meaning in our life? What are the things that give us value and esteem, that define who we are? This, this takes work and crafting. It takes effort. It takes imagination. And it takes, again, submitting some of our freedom. In order for us to be fully thriving or flourishing, we need to be working to receive the gifts that God is giving us and dispensing them equally into all of the buckets. But we find ourselves all too often erring on the side of freedom. We want to do what we want to do no matter the cost. We have an incredible way of seeing our own perspective and not submitting to any other perspectives. In that scenario, we become number one. And so we need to ask, we need to ask ourselves, what is it that truly matters to us? Is it really freedom that we want? want? I mean, is that really what we want our life to be defined by? That we were a, a lone person doing our own thing all the way through? Or are we willing to submit ourselves to creating meaning in our lives and finding community and relationships in our lives? There's a story I, I saw at a, actually at a Jimmy John's that, um, that really illustrates this, um, this struggle of how it is we're going to define our life. Uh, this story just speaks to me, <laughs> so I'm going to share it with you. Just read it off my phone. But uh, just think about the, uh, the alignments in life, the values that we find as you hear this story. What truly matters? The American investment banker was at a pier in a small coastal Mexican village with a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several large fin tuna. The American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish and asked him how long it took him to catch them. The Mexican replied, only a little while. The American then asked why he didn't stay out longer and catch more fish. The Mexican said he had enough to support his family's immediate needs. The American then asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? The Mexican fisherman said, I sleep late, I fish a little, play with my children, take a siesta with my wife, Maria, stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and play guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life. The American scoffed. I'm a Harvard MBA and I could help you. You should spend more time fishing and with the proceeds buy a bigger boat. And with the proceeds from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats. Eventually, you could have a fleet of fishing boats. Instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you would sell directly to the processor, eventually opening up your own cannery. You would control the product, processing, and distribution. You would need to leave this small coastal fishing village and move to Mexico City, and then L.A. and eventually New York City, where you could run your expanding empire. The Mexican fisherman asked, but how long will this take? To which the American replied, oh, about 15 to 20 years. But then what? The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would announce an IPO and sell your company stock to the public and become very rich. You would make millions. Millions, asked the fisherman. Then what? The American said, 
then you would retire, move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, take a siesta with your wife, stroll the village in the evening, sip wine, and play your guitar with your amigos. What are the things that truly matter to us? What are our values? Where do we find meaning? Are we doing enough work to find meaning and create community in our lives? Are we recovering and investing in our relationships? Or are we working like crazy so that we can bring in resources so that we can have more freedom? When we're the most, I mean, look at America. We're the most free people in the entire world, right? We have incredible freedom. And yet we keep trying to fill freedom with more and more and more. And what seems to be lacking in this system that isn't quite working for people is meaningful connections with others, both in our family and on our relationships around with us, and also meaning why it is we do it all, who it is we are, what it is we value, what it is that names our purpose. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about the latter two, particularly our relationships. I told you that's what I want to talk about stewarding. But I wanted to diagnose what I thought maybe the problem was first before we talk about relationships. There are a lot of relationships that we have in our lives, things that are super important that then create meaning in our life. We are parents, spouses, coworkers, neighbors, friends. We could go on and on and on, but some of these are our real core ones. And so I ask you, God is pouring out all these blessings. We are diverting them. How much of the blessings that God is pouring into our lives, the love, the love of God that we have that we're then supposed to spread around to us, how much work are we putting into our parenting, into our spouse, into our coworkers, our neighbors, our friends? Are they experiencing the love of God pouring out of our lives? Or are they receiving leftovers? Do the people closest to us get bitterness, anger, exhaustion? Or in their relationship with us, are they experiencing the love of God flown through our lives, coming out and hitting everyone? That is the alignment that Jesus calls us to that we have perfect love of God, that God fills us with his perfect love, and that then those around us experience the love of God through our interaction with them. That is the peculiar way of life that Jesus is calling us to live. And instead, we are filling our buckets with freedom so that I can be the mini-God of my own life. So I ask you, just take a moment and think about what you bring to these relational structures. Who are you when you're a parent? Who are you? What, what do you flow out with when you're a spouse? Who do your coworkers know? What about your neighbors? What kind of friend are you? Are you overflowing with the love of God in these places? Do people know God better? Do your kids know God better because you're their parent? Does your spouse know the love of God by how you love them? Do your coworkers, neighbors, and friends know about a God who is love and yearning to see you flourish and forgiven and saved because of the way you love them? That's a different way of life than we are taught in our American society. But our American society, we know, isn't functioning quite right. People are looking for all kind of meaning and community in all sorts of strange and peculiar places right now. Because it's not readily available and we lived in a confused place, and God is calling us to a peculiar way of life that is more properly and rightly ordered in relationship with our creator that then puts us in good relationship with our world. It realigns us properly to who we have been created to be. And so, 
if any of these relationships aren't quite in alignment. If we could just testify and be honest. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I'm not perfect on this stuff. I'm making mistakes. Uh, uh, I'm not always the greatest of parent. I'm not always the greatest of spouse. I'm not always the greatest of friend or neighbor, right? We, we all struggle in these things. So how is it that we can recover a right place in our relationships? How can we again say relationships matter to me and I want them to be God-ordered and properly aligned? It seems to me the best answer to that is this forgiveness. Your relationships are out of order, that are out of order. Things aren't right with your kids. Things aren't right with your spouse. You're at war with your neighbor. You don't like your boss. How is it that you can recover those relationships? Most likely, if you trace it back to the place that anger all began, the best work you can do is follow the model that your God has given you, and that is forgive. You see, the thing about our inability to forgive is it's our declaring that I am in moral superiority to you. That's what lack of forgiveness is. It's saying that I am morally superior to you, that I see it better, I see it more clearly, I am more right, I have it better than you do. And that's not the sort of relationships that model our love for God. Our love for God comes from the fact that we are forgiven by God, that God has gone out before us to forgive us. And so we live in love because we've experienced incredible, perfect love. And what we're asked by Jesus to do is then to pass it on. And fundamentally, I think we struggle feeling that we're living in a broken system because we're not willing to recover our relationships by being the kind of people who will forgive. And so the thing about your relationships that are out of order right now, maybe your, your children at home, it's just not working. Maybe it's your grown-up children. Maybe your marriage is in a place that feels broken. Um, who knows what it is you're struggling with. But the thing that we're missing in these places is forgiveness, that we can't look people in the eye that we have professed to love and just simply let it go. We always want the moral high ground. We want to be right. And so often we value being right over being in right relationship with other people. And that is a brokenness that's very hard to overcome. And so in order to recover our relationships, we have to risk freedom. We have to risk freedom. We have to risk our willingness and desire to always be right, always be able to do what I want to do, always be able to have it my way. And we have to submit every once in a while. Now, now the one caveat that I want to give, this is very important, is I'm not talking about an abusive relationship, okay? When we're talking about forgiveness here, uh, if there's someone uh, in your life, a relationship that's broken because you're being abused. I'm not talking about just forgiving and forgetting and moving on here, okay? If you're in an abusive relationship, you, you talk to me and I'll come and support you, okay? You should not be in any relationship where you are being abused in any way, shape, or form, all right? That's not what I'm talking about here, all right? I'm talking about different sort of relationships, when we're, we're on equal footing and trying to teach other respect. We treat each other with respect. We have got to recover forgiveness so that we can again submit into these relationships and find community and meaning in our relationships with one another. I, I think that when things boil down in life, especially as I've talked to our aged people, people that I've pastored, the things that matter most, the things that they wish most is that they had cultivated their relationships in their life better. That's where meaning is so often found, is in families, in church families, in knowing people and having friendships and laughs and joy with one another. And we are in a system instead where we are drinking freedom by the gallons and wondering why it is we don't have good relationships and wondering what all of this means and asking big questions like that. We've got to submit some freedom in order to have meaning and in order to have community and relationships. So where do we go from here? What do we do with that? 
Um, if you're feeling like your family is out of alignment, if you're feeling like you're, you're struggling to, uh, to even love each other, be patient with one another, or be in good relationship with your children or your spouse or your kids with each other, he, here's my practical advice that I'm going to kind of land on with you guys today. Uh, I, would, I think it's really important to not just keep perpetuating the chaos that you're living in, right? Don't just keep living the way you're living now and hoping that, oh, someday it'll all come together and be okay. We'll get there. You've got to live with intention in your life. You've got to have a plan of some sort, right? And so instead, what we so often do that's such a grave mistake is that Dad has his plans, and he's perpetuating his goals, and he's chasing after them professionally and aspirationally and working them. And Mom has her own idea of what she wants to do, and she's chasing these values and doing these things, and both of them are spending 20 years with their kids yelling at each other at which one is more important. And they're going after the things they want to go after, and then the kids find their own things that they want to do, and they start getting involved in the places and things that they want to do, and they start developing their own personality. And the day comes where everyone's now middle-aged and grown and everyone's been going in such opposite directions that what seems like the best option now is divorce. The most common divorce that I've seen in the church is after the kids leave home and mom and dad don't know each other anymore. And the kids then are hurt and on their own and chasing their own personal lives and there's no longer any family unity with one another together. And so, how do we avoid that? It's not too late. It's not too late. Sit down with one another and talk about what matters. Submit to your spouse's goals every once in a while. Sit down and maybe make a list of three or four values of what matters to your family. What are the core pieces of who we are and what we're going to be? Think 20 years down the road, 20 years from now, what do I want my life to look like? What do I want my kid's life to look like? If you're not doing this work at some level with your spouse, with your kids, if you're not visioning together where you're going, you're just going to let the chaos of the world spiral you out of control, and you're not going to get to where you want. And 20 years from now, you're going to look back and wonder where it all went wrong. If you want to cultivate a certain sort of family life, certain sort of values, if you want your children to grow up loving Christ first and foremost, that's got to be a core value of how you schedule your life, where you spend your money, how you spend your time, right? If you want to love your spouse and you want to reach a 50th anniversary filled with joy and appreciation for one another, you've got to name that as a value. And sometimes that means setting your hobby aside of playing video games late at night or binge-watching shows so you can listen to their boring stories about work, right? Like, you have to submit to one another. And you have to sit down and say, these are the three, four, five goals that my family, this is who we are, this is our values, our vision, who we're going to be. And then every chaos or struggle or problem that comes along, you can sit together and say, this is the problem, this is who we want to be, how do we get from problem to where we want to be in this scenario? And you can sit together and always have to get a shared, common family goal and vision around who it is that we're trying to cultivate ourselves to be. And that way, the world and its broken system isn't the one that's constantly shifting and moving and leading us into places. Instead, hopefully, it's a Christ-driven, Christ-centered, God-ordained, love-filled vision that always calls us to recenter ourselves in God. And it becomes a stabilizing force that gives us hope and not problems in this world constantly. Find a family vision. Find a set of dreams and goals. Submit, share, be honest with one another. And do it surrounded by the love that God fills our heart with and the task of forgiveness. You can walk back the problems from your past. You can let them go. It may seem like hard work. It may feel like hard work. But fighting for your own perspective isn't worth it. It's just not. It's not worth it. Having healthy relationships, 
is the harder work, but it's the one that brings meaning. And it's the one that brings true joy to your life. Being right all the time, drinking gulps of freedom all the time doesn't bring joy. It brings chaos. Appreciate the freedoms you have and invest yourself in relationships and meaning. And you'll find that there's enough freedom. There's more than enough freedom to go around. But invest yourself in the other places and see how much our chaotic lives begin to fall into alignment with the call that God has placed in our lives. And people will begin to see that, yeah, we're peculiar. Yeah, we're living at different paces. Yeah, we don't get involved in all the things that everyone else is chasing after. We live at a different pace and a different lifestyle than everyone else. But there's joy and there's love and there's something really attractive to the world about that. And they may even begin to wonder what's different about you in a way that helps them find Christ. The band is going to come out and sing a song that I love. And I don't know how you want to respond today. Um, you may just want to stand and sing out, and that's great. You may want to come and kneel at the altar and, and pray to God that God would give you some clarity about next steps in your life. Where, where would God have you go from here? What are the things that you want to value? What are the things that you really should be giving your life and centering your life around? You're welcome to come and pray if you would like to do that, and God will be faithful to meet you at the altar. But let's respond together by, by praise, by singing, or however it is you see fit. This is your time to work through with God and listen to what he has to say. Would you stand with me as we finish? Thank you.